Tonight on Moments, we talk about survivors whose breaths got taken away, but for just a moment. However, they survived. Our guests today are Bamidile Salako, a writer and journalist who survived a tough childhood, and Chioma Onyuke, lawyer and advertising practitioner who survived late stage ovarian cancer after five months of treatment. Let their stories inspire you to survival. I was born with a silver spoon, so to speak. So things were pretty, you know, creamy, but things took a downturn. I went to see the gynecologist and I ran some blood tests and it was found I had ovarian cancer. Mm. I thought I was a healthy woman. And it all starts now. Bamidele Salako is a managing partner at Outright, a startup media and communications company and also editor at large at online news and current affairs platform SecureNigeria365.com. Before now, he was an associate analyst at Nigeria's foremost PR consultancy, the Cordman Company, and was also head editorial at Africa's leading celebrity magazine, Ovation International Magazine. He joins us right now to share his survival story. Welcome to the show. Thank Hi, you very welcome. Much. It's a pleasure You've to be here. Done so many things. Just sharing all of that right now was quite a mouthful. So let us know who you are and let's hear your story. I was born with a silver spoon, so to speak. I was born in what I would call an upper middle class family. It was bear and skittles growing up. Dad was a government contractor and mom was, she had a fashion store and she was also, she also had a wine shop and then had another fabric store. So things were pretty, you know, creamy, so to speak. And, but things took a downturn. So mom thought that to secure our futures, she had to send the three older kids, there were six of us, mm -hmm. so she had to send the three older kids abroad mm -hmm. to go stay with relatives. Okay. So I went to DC. Um, my immediate younger sister went to UK. Then the other sister went to Chicago. Wow. Yeah, so I, I didn't know the reality that was awaiting me in DC. I was 20 at the time. I could say I was a spoiled kid because I had 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 everything done for me by my family. Mm -hmm. You know, even when I got an admission, which I couldn't really follow through with in school back then in Kano, we lived in Kano, um, it was delivered to me on a platter. Mm -hmm. You know, like I didn't really have to do anything to get it. But now here I was in DC living with an uncle I had barely lived with ever. And um, he told me up front, he was a nice guy, a wonderful man, but he told me up front, this is America. <laughs> There are no friends here, there are no, you have to work hard, you know, things have changed. I didn't really get the full picture until I got my first job in DC. I was working at a car lot, sold, sold used cars. So um, I, I had to clean, you know, the, the environment, I had to clean the environment, I had to wash the cars, like literally wash the cars. These are things I had never done before. Mm -hmm. So it was like a real shock to me, like, man, this is really happening. Like, these were not the dreams I had growing up, talking with my friends and all. I'd had dreams of, you know, leaving the university by 20, you know, getting a great job, getting married by 25. These were the dreams I had. Mm. But here I was washing cars in America, mm. sweeping floors. Then later I got a night job where I had to work in a restaurant. Then later I had to get another job where I were cleaning offices. You know, so this was really shocking to me. And don't forget that mom had not told me everything that was really going on. So at a point, I was like, man, I can't go on doing this. So one day I just got a ticket and I came back to Nigeria. And when I got back to Kano, I found that my mom and my stepdad had separated. Mm. You know, so this was like a new reality for me. I was like, what's going on here? Then I called her and she just broke down in tears like, we sent you to America, I had to sell my very expensive jewelry, I had to sell stuff to get you to go to America, and you came back like, this is an opportunity many in Nigeria are looking for. Mm -hmm. You got it on the plaza and you went, so what's gonna happen now and everything? I'm like, mom, you didn't tell me what was going on. Mm -hmm. you know? So I had to settle down into this new reality because she was then going to go to the UK so she could fend for us. My life just went downhill from there. Like, my family members were bitter and angry at me, like, you're such a sports brat. You know, you went to America, it's an opportunity people are looking for. Mm. You just threw it out into the wind and now you're here. Who's going to fend for you? Like, so people literally left me to myself. Our story continues with our guest after this. 
Welcome back to Movement Nigeria. For some, moving abroad is greener pastures. Well, for Bavin Dele, before we went on a break, he was talking to us about his challenges upon moving back and how his life went downhill from there. So you said re returning back to Nigeria was a harsh reality with family members thinking that, yeah. you know, you are a sports brat. Yes. And, you know, let us know how things went downhill okay. and how you managed to, you know. So back. now I couldn't um, find a way to get myself back to school. Obviously, my mom just went to the UK and friends whom she had helped before and family she had helped before were not willing to take her into their home. So it got so bad to a point that she was sleeping in train stations. Wow. You know, yeah, it was really bad. So I had to get a job unloading paint trucks in Ikeja, our lower road, I can't forget. Every time I pass that, I just look at like, that's, that's my story right there. Mm -hmm. So I was unloading paint trucks. It got, I, I had just two pairs of clothes, two wow. shirts, two pieces of trousers. And sometimes I saw friends we had gone to school together, driving by, and I had to hide mm. because I didn't want them to see me in this new condition I was in. Mm. I, I tried to do jam, you know, they would, I would pass, but then at the point of doing the entrance examinations in the university, I would find that they had seized my result. Mm. This was, I had this experience like three consecutive times, mm. and I had an aunt come tell me that it's like there's something diabolical. It's spiritual. Yeah, it's mm. spiritual, that this is not ordinary. So she took me to a mountain in Ekiti. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, we went to pray over there. We came back to Lagos. She took me to another white garment church, you know, did prayers for me and all of that, you know. But things didn't really change, you know. Mm. So things got worse with my family because now they thought I was just unserious. Like I was plain unserious. I was not ready to go back to school. I was not ready to do anything. I got really bitter and I went into the streets. I started to do drugs. I started to do weed, you know. Decided to do all sorts of rubbish that I, I could never have done. I just lost focus from there on. And I was there for like three years wow. in that state. No focus, no dreams, no ambitions, nothing. Then in 2006, you know, after a drunken spree, you know, I woke up the next day with this very terrible hang hangover. And then I had an epiphany, like, this is not me. There's more to me. Than this. I mean, I was an A-lister in school, in secondary school. This can't be happening to me, you know. So for some reason I can't explain. I just saw um, a magazine on, it's, a, it's like a motivational magazine. I saw it on the dining in the house and I picked it up and I began to read. And there was this column about discover your purpose. So I read it and it was as though the author knew my story. Mm. It was as though he was talking to me, you know. So I read it and fortunately for me, his number and his email address were just on, at the bottom of the article. So I called him up and I told him I'd like to see him. We booked an appointment, I went to see him. I told him my whole life story and I could see he was really touched. And then he told me that he has a similar story, maybe not as bad as mine, but that he once worked at Alaba International Markets. Mm -hmm. like, that was where he was, he was brought from the village and worked there. And he never went to primary school or secondary school, but he went from Alaba to Unilag, he studied philosophy and came out with the 2-1. Wow. You know, so that sort of inspired me. Mm. So he told me this was not the end to your life. Mm. Like, there's a reason why we've met. Like, there's a reason. And I'm going to help you rediscover your passion, your verve for life, help you rediscover a meaning to life. Mm. And that was how it began. I used to have this um, passion for writing. You know, so he helped me rediscover that. And then I began to develop it. And I applied to go to the Nigerian Institute of Journalism. And then I took Polyjam, which was what we needed to do to get in. And then I passed in flying colors. Mm -hmm. The entrance examination, I came out with the best results. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I can't afford to mess this up mm -hmm. this time around. So I was really putting a lot of effort, you know. And then the results came out of the first semester. It was all A's. Like they said, like, that was the best results ever they had ever had in the history of the school. It was all A's like that. And then the next semester, and then we did the two, uh, the two sessions, and then we we're going to have our convocation. And I didn't know what to expect. I was just going to come for the convocation, like, wow, this is a step up. And then we had the graduation manual, and I saw my name. I was going to collect four awards, best student awards, best overall student, best student in three particular wow. subjects. Amazing. And, you know, when I was invited to come give a speech, you know, 
after I received the awards, I just broke down in tears hmm. because I, at that moment, my history just flashed before mm -hmm. me. I couldn't believe that this was me. Yeah. You know, from then on, you know, it's been a difference. I got into Ovation International Magazine with Chief Dele Momodo. He brought me in and I had my internship there and then I was retained and then rose to the level of editor within the magazine, mm -hmm. you know, and from then on, it's been one great story now, you have your own After, so now we have our own like with a partner for those who are watching at home this is very important because yeah. there's someone somewhere mm -hmm. who like you is probably pissing their lives away you know not because they want to but because they've got the short end of yeah. the stick what are those things you can share with them to have them wake up on the side that you did yeah I, i'd like to tell them that um, even though everybody else gives gives up on, on them they should not give up on themselves. Well, thank you so much, Pamdele, for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. We it's really appreciate it. Thank you. Man. Well, it's now time for a short break, but we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Moments Nigeria. Today on the show, we're talking about inspiring stories of survival. And our next guest is a cancer survivor. Her name is Chioma Owokwe. Welcome to the show, Chioma. Thank you very much. Welcome, Welcome have to you. the show. Thank you. So you're here, you're a lawyer. Yes, I am. All right. Uh, and, um, you know, you have battled cancer. Yes, I have. So would you share your story with us? Sure, sure. Um, in 2008, um, when I had just finished law school and was about to start work at a law firm, um, I discovered I had some sort of bloatedness. And um, I didn't really think much about it. You know, I just shoved it aside and decided to pursue, you know, starting work at a law firm because you know, it was exciting, an exciting time for me. Um, but what made it, what made me look into it seriously was when I went out and someone asked me if I was pregnant. So I had to go do a scan, you know. And when I did the scan, um, it was found that I had some fluid in my abdomen. It was called ascites and that's a sign of some sort of malignancy. I went to see the gynecologist and I ran some blood tests and it was found I had ovarian cancer. Mm. You know, that was just, uh, you know, bought out of the blue for someone at my age. I think I was 27 at that point. Oh, wow. yeah. And I thought I had everything going for me. I, was, I thought I was a healthy woman. And all of a sudden to have that um, diagnosis was shocking and mind boggling. Um, I remember my 10-month-old baby was there with me and I just looked at him and I had questions, you know, asking why at this time and why me, you know. But eventually we sought treatment abroad, although getting to that point was a challenge, but I had family, friends support me financially and otherwise. So I was able to go abroad and I was referred to um, um, an oncologist who, who actually was the only one in the UK that dealt with my kind of cancer. Mm. So when I got there, I ran more tests and it was found I had a rare form of ovarian cancer called yolk sac tumor. You know, so I had to go through the chemotherapy treatment, um, had to deal with the side effects of chemo. Mm. Which, what, what was the side effects for you? The side effects were losing my hair you know, nausea, vomiting, and just, you know, dark nails, dark skin, um, and all of that. Was so, there any history of cancer in your family? Not at all. No, no. There's no history. So, you know, you're 27, you have a baby, mm -hmm. you're just about to start work. That experience of, I think there's a place where the reality of this is what your life is now, and finally getting to a place of seeking treatment. How did you get there and what did your family members say to you and how, were they supportive? Yes, they were quite supportive. I mean, it took me a while to kind of get used to my reality mm -hmm. and just find, you know, know that from then on, um, I had to just to be positive. I had to have a positive outlook because again, it has to do with your mindset, mm -hmm. you know. So that period in the UK, I searched, you know, I just was searching within and I did a lot of praying, did a lot of reading, listened to a lot of faith-based, you know, CDs, DVDs, and watched DVDs as well. And it kind of, you know, it made my faith rise, mm. you know. And as a result of that, 
in spite of what I went through, you know, I had a positive outlook. And people would see me at that point and they would say, there must be something, you know, making you the way you are. Because going through this kind of, you know, this kind of um, issue, you shouldn't be the way you are, you shouldn't have a positive outlook. Even the doctor that um, treated my case was like, told my husband that there's really something she's doing for her to improve, you know, mm. to, for me to have improved the way I did. Mm. And just being able to encourage other people, you mm. know. Can you talk to us about some of your really tough days and how you pull through those tough times? Sure. Um, the first time, the first chemotherapy treatment that was administered to me, um, I really reacted badly to it and actually sent me to coma. Mm. Um, I stayed in coma for about two days. Really? Yes, I did. And um, after that, we had to try another course, another compilation of um, drugs, chemotherapy drugs. And I remember then my husband reminded me that he had to sign a consent form because those drugs were more toxic than mm. the initial one, you know. But with that, when I went through the chemo, when I took that, there was a massive improvement and the cancer cells, you know, dis, you know disappeared over a, a period of time. Do you feel a responsibility to, you know, support cancer charities and kind of speak out about, you know, what you're going through just to kind of help those who may be currently, you know, going through cancer and maybe not sure of how to feel or how to process, you know, the diagnosis? Yes, most definitely. I'm... Um, um, I do some counselling, you know, I counsel some cancer patients and I try to encourage them. Um, I'm also part of the initiative to prevent cancer, so to prevent cervical and mm -hmm. breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, last year as well, um, my husband and I, during his 40th birthday, um, we did a fundraising to establish a cancer centre in our village in Nemo, mm -hmm. where we come from. So it's a, a cervical cancer screening center, as well as a treatment facility for treating precancer lesions. Thank um, you so much, yeah. Chairman, for sharing that with us. And we do hope to our viewers at home, if you know anyone who is currently battling cancer or has survived cancer, we hope that this interview has somehow sort of put you in a positive light. Your positive attitude is one that is so commendable. Beautiful. And we hope Thank that you, you continue so to grow positively and uh, good luck with everything that you Thank doing. you very much. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Coming up on the show, it's In A Nutshell. In a nutshell, I just, this, the spirit, the human spirit is such a beautiful one when we are able to overcome and we're able to just set our minds to whatever it is that we want to survive. Mm. I think both Chema and Bami Dele really just gave, every time we have I Survive, I'm always just so like, yes, mm. I can do yes. it. And yeah. I think for me, what I learned the most from Chema's interview is mm. actually, the positive attitude, like mm. just seeing how even when you're told you're ill and you begin to get better because you start to think that you're getting better. Mm. So a lot has to do with the mind, as mm. Polani said, mm. and Definitely. I'm never going to take that for granted. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, for me, Bam Dele really inspired me because, you know, what I took away from his story was that you never know what tomorrow holds. So even if today you're in the worst situation and you're just so depressed and you're down and you don't know, you know whether to mm. turn left or right, that could all change in an instant. So it's really to have hope for a better tomorrow, whatever your situation, your current situation may be. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, it's now time for our question of the day. And this one is a good, nice, reflective one. Um, what is your most memorable struggle? Mm, well, that's a good or one. a struggle that you remember, it doesn't have to be the most memorable. That's a good one. I think for me, my most memorable struggle is when I first, well, one of them, is when I first moved back to Nigeria mm -hmm. and I did not have a job, you guys. I was at home day in, day out. Yeah. All my friends were all at work. I was just, I had no one to call. I think for me, definitely, it would be when I was in uni, my senior year of uni, I almost flunked out of school. Mm -hmm. um, I was a straight A student and my sex until last semester, I got an F in one of my courses. Mm -hmm. And it was, for someone who held so much pride in being a straight A student, mm -hmm. I remember calling my mom and saying, I'm quitting school and I'm coming back to Nigeria. <laughs> no. it was, I was so dramatic. Yeah. That is um, dramatic. And you know, I had to, the last semester, it was just a situation of constantly having to be like, yeah, your identity is not in your grades, mm. it's not in doing well academically, yes. yeah. and almost not beating myself over and over again. Mm. I've graduated, thank God, but mm. I had to, it took a while, it took longer to graduate than I thought it would. But look at you now. Exactly. Mm. Success. Success. Present. Okay. <laughs> I mean, for me, my most memorable one now would be going through a divorce. Yeah. Mm. That was one of the hardest 
just even waking up and finding out that the person I was with was having a child yeah. was is like life sucked out mm -hmm. air from me. Mm -hmm. It was really difficult. Mm -hmm. It's gotten me through one of the most hardest times in different occasions. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Just whatever it is, when you go to bed, remember this, you would wake up the next morning, the mm -hmm. sun is going to shine, the stars will come out at night, the trains will still be at the train station at the time it's supposed to. You better get up and get on with it or it would leave you behind. And on that note, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you have been that inspired and we hope that you have the strength to you know, just chase away the bad days and the courage to go through those times that are here to shake you. And hopefully you come out on the other side. Remember to join us again on another episode of Moments. And remember, if, if you, you can, can think, think it, it, you can, can do, do it. it.